Hello, I'm Elizabeth Ashley and the lecture I'm going to tell you today is about the endocannabinoid system that I wrote and presented at the Budapest Drops Conference in 2017 in Hungary. First, let me tell you a little bit about me. I'm Elizabeth Ashley, the secret healer, and I'm author of 20 books, including one on cannabis. I qualified as an aromatherapist in 1993, but that was already a long way down my aromatherapy journey, being the daughter and the stepdaughter of two of the first aromatherapists in the United Kingdom, right back in the 1980s. Now, my mom, Jill Bruce, was one of the founder members of the International Federation of Aromatherapists. And her late husband, Michael Cook, was the chairman of the British Society of Dowsers and one of the best aromatherapists I have yet to meet. From the age of 11, I was travelling with them on weekends to craft fairs and agricultural shows to sell their pots of cream. Now I'm grown up. I live in a beautiful town in England called Ludlow, which is on, in Shropshire near the border of Wales. It's a medieval town with an ancient ruined castle and it's surrounded by beautiful rolling hills. And if you've ever read any of the J.R. Tolkien stories like The Hobbit or The Lords of the Rings, they're written about Middle Earth. And Middle Earth was the views he enjoyed close to my home. Now, I can enjoy those views as I write in the Secret Healer's Shed. And when I'm not writing, I work in my beautiful garden that's created by my lovely husband, Daryl, or baking cakes for one of my three children, Amy, Andrew or Dexter. So, all of that data might seem a bit superfluous or a little bit smug, but if my endocannabinoid system were dysfunctional, then that picture would look very different. I wouldn't be telling you how gorgeously happy I am, because I am. <laughs> Potentially, I might not have been able to conceive those three children. I'd be more susceptible to the cold, so living in these blustery hills wouldn't be anywhere near as pleasant. I probably couldn't sit for hours writing in my drafty shed, and my aches and pains would probably have disabled me by now, and even my hands wouldn't be able to spend such a long time typing. My motivation would probably have waned by now and I'd have given up the battle to be the best I can be. And I might have been too anxious to travel to Hungary that day. Or my dopamine levels would be too low that there would be no joy at all of looking out of my window. So, in short, endocannabinoid dysfunction is a dark, scary and painful place and I'm telling you this deliberately because the science is very complex but don't let it bog you down just remember that the endocannabinoid system can seal you of health and steal you of happiness so the objective of today's lecture is to introduce the system and its parts and these are receptors, ligands, signaling, degradative enzymes, transport proteins, to understand the protocols of the CB1 and CB2 receptor, care of the endocannabinoid system and applications for your therapy. Let's look at receptors and ligands first. What are they? Well, we call the molecule that acts like a key, a ligand, and the receptor acts like a lock, engineered to let only good matches work. Good, not perfect, because molecules that are very similar will also fit. Now that's a good description, but it's a bit outdated because more recent thought says what they do is actually wiggle against each other. <laughs> I love this slide. And they cause a vibration. And many physicists suspect this might be the healing vibration we feel when we place our hands on someone as we kind of supercharge that action. So what might these ligands be? Well, they could be lots of things. But for you and I, the easiest to envisage are hormones 
and neurotransmitters. So let's think a bit about hormones first. These hormones are dispatched around the system as ligands and they search for receptors to lock to and then to activate. So we might think of TSH, which is secu uh, secreted from the thyroid, or maybe insulin from the pancreas. The sex hormones, obviously, like estrogen, progesterone and testosterone. Or in times of stress, we might think of cortisol. So what problems might derive from the hormone imbalances? Hormone imbalances might be something like insulin problems leading to diabetes. Oestrogen, progesterone and testosterone may cause infertility or we might see menstrual problems or polycystic ovarian syndrome. Pituitary problems could cause things like growth problems, for example, or parathyroid problems might lead to osteoporosis and thyroid problems can lead to things like Hashimoto's. Neurotransmitters then, what are they? Well, in my opinion, they're the bridge between the mind, the body and the spirit. So serotonin, for example, modulates mood, but it also controls the gut. Dopamine is related to desire and motivation, but it also controls movement, twitching and thrust. So they have feet in both camps, don't they? They have this emotional element and a physical one too. Now, if you don't know, they bridge the gap in the nervous system called the synaptic cleft. Synapses send messages through the nervous system. Electricity runs along the branches of a nerve, but nerves have gaps between them. So at the end of the nerve is what's called a bouton which is a bit like a cupboard full of messages. And from here, they dispatch neurotransmitters across this cleft to get the message to the other side. The endocannabinoid system dis differs from any other signaling protocol in the body. Most systems like hormones or neurotransmitters signal forwards from the presynaptic cell to the postsynaptic. But the endocannabinoid system sends messages backwards saying we need more or we have too much of that now stop sending it's the volume switch you can see how prolonged signaling of insulin for example without the endocannabinoid system kicking in might damage the pancreas and cause the signaling to go awry and remember these things aren't happening in isolation. It's like an information superhighway with all data rushing all ways at once. So where the job of an essential oil would normally be to excite or to make the signal bigger, inhibit or to make the signal smaller, when something interacts with the endocannabinoid system, it acts as a buffer like the side rails do on a bowling alley. Always pushing it back to centre. Each ligand has its own receptors to work with. So for example, 5-HT, 5-HT1, 5-HT1A are all serotonin receptors. Once the ligand goes into the hole stroke lock, then it opens the door or channel to a certain action. And this might be the case in cases of PTSD. It might be irritable bowel syndrome or seasonal affective disorder. And likewise, dopamine has its own set of receptors. There are opioid receptors for heroin and morphine, etc, etc. The receptors of the endocannabinoid system are cannabinoid, named after the plant that locks to them and led to their discovery. They are CB1 and CB2. CB1 receptors are found mainly in the brain, although in fewer numbers in the periphery. Are you familiar with the term periphery? We have core areas of the body in the central nervous system, which is the spinal column and the brain, spinal cord and the brain, and then the periphery is further outwards from there. 
So CB1 receptors are found in abundance in the cerebellum, cortex, amygdala, hippocampus, and the outflow tracts of the basal gang ganglia, so the brain. Things we know that the receptor gets itself involved in are memory, emotion, cognition, motor function, pain, itchiness, muscle tone, and propulsion and secretion in the gut. So if we think of that in terms of anorexia, CB1 dysregulation interferes with the appetite. Anorexia also skews levels of dopamine and serotonin. Or maybe the levels of, ser of neurotransmitters create an anorexia phenotype. We're not entirely sure. Anxiety from the disease, well, that can be corrected through the CB1 receptor. CB1 also makes food taste sweeter. And scientists think that by balancing the receptor, it actually stimulates the body to gain weight. Where CB1 is in the brain, CB2 is primarily in the periphery. And these receptors can be found on lymph nodes, bone marrow, tonsils, white blood cells, splenic tissue. They can also be found in fewer numbers in the brain, in the liver and the pancreas. CB2 receptors control immunity, pain and particularly inflammation. Okay, so let's have a bit of history for context because you might be asking yourself, why don't I already know this? Well, because it's new. An Israeli scientist by the name of Raphael Meshulam first discovered cannabidiol, the non-psychoactive component of cannabis, in 1963. That's the CBD in CBD oil. Then, a year later, discovered the psychoactive part that the world had been fascinated with for millennia, Delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol. He and his team spent many years elucidating its structure because cannabis, more than any other plant, relies on relationships between molecules to structure its medicine. So it was important they got to know each molecule in isolation. Then in 1988, what's that, uh, 24 years later, they discovered a specific set of receptors that TCH bound to. In other words, TCH was the ligand for these molecules. Then in 1992, they found the endogenous ligand. That's the one that exists naturally in our body. And we call this ligand anandamide. Anandamide is a Sanskrit word meaning bliss or joy giver. And it's not only called that because it makes life so feel so blissful, but also because of the elation after so many years of work trying to find it. Now, remember our lock. I said it only opened if there's a good match, not just a perfect one. So here we see it. Anandamide and THC are structurally very similar but not identical, but they both can activate the CB1 receptor. In fact, anandamide can lock to both the CB1 and CB2 receptor. Now, most of our understanding of the endocannabinoids, that's the ones naturally in our body, really is in its infancy. Most of what we know comes from what we know they do in rodents and if any of you go on to read my cannabis book you'll discover that sometimes it will make something happen in the mouse but not in a rat. So we certainly can't say for sure that it will be the same in humans but anandamide has been shown to impair working memory in rats. Studies are underway to explore what role anandamide plays in human behaviour such as eating and sleep patterns and pain relief. Anandamide is also important for implantation of the early stage embryo in its blastocyst form in the uterus. Okay, now how is your memory of reproduction? 
what I want you to do is to listen out for hormones. So, the hypothalamus triggers the release of FSH and LH from the pituitary. This signals the ovaries to produce estradiol and progesterone. FSH stimulates the growth and maturations of follicles in the ovaries, which house and nourish the developing eggs. The follicle, in turn, releases inhibin, which inhibits the production of FSH. Progesterone stimulates the growth of the endometrial lining of the uterus in order pre to prepare it for pregnancy. A strong surge of LH at around day 14 of the cycle triggers ovulation of an egg from the most mature follicle. After ovulation, the ruptured follicle becomes the corpus luteum to thicken the womb to support pregnancy. Anandamide signals backwards to ensure the levels are perfectly balanced. You can see how if anandamide wasn't operating, any one of these systems could go wrong. So, it's just enough, not too much. Okay, let's talk about 2-arachidonial glycerol, or 2-AG, because it's a lot easier to say. So 2-AG is the endogenous ligand of the CB1 receptor, but it shows no preference for CB1 over CB2, so it will activate both. Breast milk is full of 2-AG. Where do you think the CB1 receptors might be? They're in the baby's lips. Isn't that amazing? Here's an interesting thing about CB2. People who are on the autistic spectrum seem to have highly upregulated CB2 receptors. So in other words, there are far too many for enough ligands to be able to attach to. In other words, again, far more receptors than ligands. So, can we say that autism is caused by that? Well, no, not categorically, because there are many other anomalies with enzymes, proteins, signaling. But what we can say is that they respond to cannabis in the most astonishing ways. They come out of their internal words, uh, worlds. Mute children begin to speak, their tantrums and obsessions calm. And while scientists know that cannabis is also affecting other channels, some of the genius of the plant is most definitely executed through this CB2 receptor. It is suspected there might be other endocannabinoids apart from anandamide and 2-AG, but this hasn't been proven yet. Here's some possibilities. They all have incredibly long names. <laughs> so the first is 2-arachidonal glycerol ether, and we write that as 2-AGE, and that reduces blood pressure. The next one is called virodamine, or 0-arachidonal ethylonamine, and that has vasorelaxant properties. NADA, which is N-arachidonal dopamine, that's involved in hyperthermia, hyperlocomotion, analgesia, as well as cataplexy. So what's cataplexy? Well, this is a very strange phenomenon where the muscles lose all their power because someone's laughing too much. And the reason this happens is because NADA contra uh, contracts small, smooth muscles and relaxes blood vessels. And NADA also has neuroprotectant, and antioxidant properties and it regulates both the peripheral and the central nervous systems. There's also a theory that lysophosphatidylinositol, I'm sure I've said that wrong, <laughs> may also be an endocannabinoid interacting with a receptor which still hasn't been elucidated but it's probable that it may interact with GCPR55 when it mediates ovarian cancer. And if you're interested in that, all, all, obviously all of this is elucidated much more in my book. Some other things that affect the endocannabinoid system. The essential oil constituent, thujone, is a ketone and has a weak binding affinity to the CB1 receptor. B12 
beta caryophylline has a weak binding affinity to CB2. But CBD oil has a weak binding affinity to both of them. If you smoke and drink, you're doing yourself no good because they're believed to negatively impact the endocannabinoid system as, surprisingly, is smoking marijuana long term. In terms of boosting levels in venandamide, meditation has been proven to boost them. Cannabidiol, CBD, has an unusual property. Although it doesn't dial, uh, bind directly to the CB1 receptor, it affects it orthosterically. And what that means is it uses a back door to switch down the effects that stronger molecules might have. So for example, when THC binds to CB1, it creates a psychoactive experience. And this is executed through the allosteric receptor. CBD comes in here at the orthosteric and calms it, it switches it down. And this is best seen in cases of schizophrenia where it actually stops psychosis that's naturally executed through this receptor. When it's used with THC, it calms psychedelic trips, but on its own, it stops psychosis. Now, cannabidiol and indeed cannabis medicines as a whole work on so many other bodily systems. The easy ones to comprehend are serotonin, glutamate and dopamine receptors. But CBD also affects gene transcription and that's how it alters DNA pathways and can calm and reverse tumour growth in cancers as well as many other biological pathways. But as a quick overview, the properties of CBD are anxiolytic antipsychotic, anti-epileptic, neuroprotectant, vasorelaxant, antispasmodic, anti-ischemic, anti-cancer, anti-emetic, antibacterial, anti-diabetic, anti-inflammatory, and its stimulant of bone growth, all of which you can find in my book. So, are we all getting that if the endocannabinoid system's not working, then the body's not working? But how does it all go wrong? Well, the problems are not clear. They can be genetic, like this CB2 anomaly in autism. They might be environmental. There could be too much estrogen from phthalates, and that might alter the internal chemistry. Stress definitely has a bearing. Diet might be an issue that the system's not being nourished enough. Interestingly, endocannabinoids are manufactured from a substrate of arachidonic acid and other essential fatty acids. And one of the key problems is that enzymes degrade endocannabinoids too fast. So there's an inadequate supply to keep things level. One of the most interesting discoveries I made in this book was that we'd already found an oil that keeps levels of arachidonic acid high. And that's helichrysum, and we explain that in my helichrysum book. Arachidonic acid is originally made from omega oils. So oils low is in EFAs or essential fatty acids, no longer nourish the endocannabinoid system. So some excellent sources that you might want to add into your diet are fish oils. So, for example, cod liver oil, hemp seed oil. So we're not talking about hemp essential oil or CBD oil here. We're talking about hemp seed carrier oil. Camellia, flaxseed oil, mustard, soybean and walnut oil. However, for the aromatherapists among you, don't get too excited because... Omega oils are not absorbed through the skin, so they are completely ineffective to the endocannabinoid system if you use them as carrier oils. They have to be taken orally. I hope you found this useful and thank you for listening. Just if you want to follow me on Facebook, you can find me at facebook.com, The Secret Healer Writes. 
and also you might be interested in my essential oil summit that I'm running in November that's called beyond the essential oil recipe summit and you can find that on Facebook if you do want to look at this book or other books do head on over to Amazon and pop into your search bar Elizabeth Ashley the secret healer and it will bring up this one and any other of my 20 books please do feel free to like and share and subscribe to my channel. I appreciate all the help that you give me.